Welcome back, everyone. So for today, we're going to discuss foreign exchange markets. And to do so, we're going to look at the monetary standards, how these monetary standards evolved, what are the different monetary policies that are applied by different countries. We'll look at currencies, what currencies are, the different currency exchange rates. We will also examine the difference between direct and indirect quotations. And finally, we'll look at cross rates, forward rates, and currency swaps. So first things first, if we want to discuss how the monetary standards evolved throughout time, perhaps the best way to start is by the gold standard, which was pre-World War I. The gold standard, in short, means that the value of a particular currency was set and fixed to an ounce of gold. The very first country that adopted the gold standard was the United Kingdom. It was back in the 1800s. And the way that it was determined is through basically the UK had different had a reserve of gold. And so each ounce of gold was equivalent to a particular currency exchange rate that is equivalent to the value of the gold held by the United Kingdom. And so this is how the gold standard basically worked. So the UK was the, one of the very first to adopt the gold standard. And then other countries, including the US, started adopting the gold standard as well. However, later on in the 1900s, the gold standard, the UK decided to unpeg its currency. So what we had in terms of the gold standard was some sort of a peg the currency. And we will look together what does a peg what pegging means. And so in the 1900s, the UK decided to unpeg its currency from the gold. And so the currency or the pound sterling became a free floating currency. And the reason for the unpegging was because, again, the United Kingdom was trying to finance its operations, was trying to finance for the war that was going on in Europe. And so because of that, they needed to print money. Having the gold standard meant that you are unable to print money if you, have, you are unable to print money if it exceeds the value of the gold that you held in your reserves. However, by printing an excess money from from the reserve, basically, the UK unpegged its currency from the gold. And so this was pre-World War I. And now, post-World War II, what we had a different system. We had a different standard, the Bretton Woods standard, which was basically the basis for the creation of the IMF or the International Monetary Fund. And as for the Bretton Woods, the Bretton Woods came to request the standardization and the stability of the currency exchanges, the currency exchange rates, basically in a way to try to prevent competitive devaluation of the currencies. And so in the 1970s, basically, the agreement did not, did not work. So countries started to withdraw from the agreement and the currencies that were part of the Bretton Woods Agreement became free-flowing currencies. And by free-flowing, we will see together what a free-flowing currency refers to and what it means once we look at, once we look at the different currencies and the currency exchanges. But what we're concerned about here in terms of the Bretton Woods Agreement is that once the, once the agreement fell and certain countries started to and make or turn their currencies into free floating currencies. Uh, for example, many countries decided to peg their currency to the US dollars, while others decided to peg it to the Deutsche Mark. Now, with that in mind, we also have different monetary policies that different countries opt for or adopt, depending on the situation that they're going through or depending on the kind of simulation, simulation for the economy that they want to create. For example, we have what is referred to as an expansionary monetary policy. And using the expansionary monetary policy, governments aim to stimulate the growth in the national economy. And how do they do this exactly? They do it by expanding the supply, the supply of money, basically in, in a way that is more than the, that they would do usually. 
At the same time, they might also opt for lowering the short-term interest rates. And in that way, they aim to simulate the national economy, to simulate the growth in the national economy. On the other hand, we have a contractionary monetary policies. And as part of the use of this kind of monetary policy, states here or countries aim to decrease the money supply so that they could counter raising inflation rates. And here, what countries would do or what governments would do is basically reduce their spending or what they would do also is lower the rate of their monetary expansion. Now, there is another type of a monetary policy that some countries opt for, and this is known as the Tobin tax. And the Tobin tax is simply a tax that a country or a government imposes on international flow of money, so international flow of capital, in a way that would allow them to reduce the movement of exchange rates. And that basically helps them limit the inflow and outflow of international capital. And the reason that they do this is basically to reduce the spending or to lower the rate of monetary expansion. Other states used it as a way to try to control the rising debt, like in Italy in 2013, for example. Now, these are just different monetary policies that governments would opt for. And this is a brief look into the monetary standards uh, that we had throughout the years. Now, with that in mind, we've discussed while looking at the Bretton Woods Agreement and while looking at the gold standard, we've discussed few terms like a pegged currency and the free floating currency. And this is exactly what we're going to look into here. But before we do that, the very first thing that we need to remember is the foreign exchange rates. And by foreign exchange rates, what we mean is the value of a particular currency when measured against another one. So basically, the value of a US dollar, for example, against the Mexican peso. Now, if we're talking about currencies that are free floating or maybe even uh, currencies that are pegged, normally we have what is referred to as either managed exchange rates or demand-based exchange rates. So the demand-based exchange rates are basically, or fleet floating cu currencies, are basically currencies that their value is basically allowed to be determined by the supply and demand of this particular currency. So it is basically up to the market to determine its value. Now, this is what is known as a free floating currency. And an example of that is the US dollar. On the other hand, if we're talking about managed exchange rates or managed currencies, here we're talking about um, perhaps a dirty float or what is referred to as a dirty float. And in this instance, you have currencies basically that their exchange rate is determined or set by a particular government. I think about the Malaysian ringgit, for example. Now, a fixed exchange rate is when you have a particular currency that have an exchange rate fixed to a particular foreign currency. So think about the Saudi Rial, where the price of a Saudi Rial is already fixed to a US dollar per every unit of US dollar. A soft peg is basically a form of tying a currency to another currency, to the national currency to a foreign currency. So in a way, it is a fixed type of, of a fixed, uh, fixed currency. Now, when it comes to the soft peg, on the other hand, is a different form of fixed currency exchange rate. So here, what we're talking about is a currency that's value is determined by the market. However, the government intervenes if the exchange rate starts to move rapidly in one direction. This is, for example, the case of the Costa Rican column. The crawling peg, on the other hand, is basically a form of an exchange uh, rate where the currency, the national currency, is allowed to fluctuate within a particular ratio. Think of the Honduran Limpira, for example. On the other hand, when we're talking about fixed exchange rates, we have another form of a fixed exchange rate that is known as a hard peg. And the hard peg or the dollarization is basically a form of fixed exchange rate whereby the central government determines the value of the, of the national currency. Think about the Argentinian peso in 1999 or the Lebanese lira, Lebanese pound 
pre-2019. A currency merger, on the other hand, is basically when a country decides to join a, a, another country in the use of one common, one country or more, in the use of one common currency. For example, the euro. Now, with these in mind, now that we know all the different currency exchange, all the different types of currencies, it is perhaps a good time for us to start learning about what direct codes and what are indirect codes and how they are calculated and how they help us basically understand the, the currency exchange rate of the different foreign currencies. Direct currency code is basically when we try to calculate or measure the number of national currency units that we need to buy a particular foreign currency. On the other hand, or on the flip side, you have the indirect currency code. And here, what we do, we have foreign currency. And so we try to measure how much we can buy with that foreign currency in a national currency. Now, normally, when we talk about direct codes and indirect codes, the base currency that we always calculate on is the US dollar. However, there are some exceptions to that rule, which is basically when we talk about Commonwealth-based currencies or even the UK or even the British pound. Now, to calculate the direct code, all we need to do is basically the direct code equals one over the indirect code. So it's very straightforward. There's nothing much to it to, there's no much room for confusion or no much room for difficulty over here. Now, when we're talking also about currency exchange rates, there are a few things that we can look into. So we can look at the forward rates and normally forward rates are settlement prices or the settlement price of a particular forward contract. Now, these forward rates, basically, they act as an indication of the market's expectations of a particular price movement in the future. But one thing that we need to highlight here, and perhaps it is the first time you might hear of it, a settlement price. A settlement price is basically the spot rate. And the spot rate is the transacted exchange rate that the buyers and the sellers agreed on at a particular period of time. Now, on the other hand, we have forward contracts, which was basically the basis of the forward rates. And forward contracts are uh, the exchange of a pre-agreed on amount of money or currency, basically, on a predetermined date between the buyer and the seller at a specific exchange rate that they've agreed on before. Now, these forward contracts are normally traded in forward markets and forward markets are there for currency markets for transactions at a forward rate. Now, there are also other things that are associated with the forward contracts and with currency exchanges. And one of those is basically the currency, the cross rates. Now, a cross rate is the exchange rate of two currencies that are not particularly used or official for the country where the exchange code is being given. Now, a currency, a currency swap is basically when you have the buying and selling of a particular currency for two different dates happening all at the same time. So the buying and selling takes place at the same time for, for this currency at two different dates. Now, we looked at the, what we will look at now is basically the spot contracts. And spot contracts is when you buy and sell commodities, securities, or even currencies for a settlement on a particular spot date. And as we said, the spot date is normally two business dates after the trade took place. Derivatives as you may know, is basically a financial product that's value is derived from an underlying asset. And this underlying asset comes in the form of a financial instrument that could be either, all, that could also be a commodity or it could be a, another currency. Now, the final thing that we'll be discussing today is the bootstrapping method. And the bootstrapping method is basically a way 
to try and find out the zero coupon fixed income yield curve for from a price of a set of coupon bearing products. Now, these coupon bearing products are normally bonds or swaps. But how does this happen? So basically, let's assume we are trying to find how much interest we can get from lending money to different through different periods of time. In this case, what we want to do is we want to look at the price of some of the products that could pay interest. And here we are looking basically at either bonds or we're looking at uh, or at swaps. And now after this, what we normally would do is we would look at these products and figure out their different maturity dates because each product has its own maturity date and has its own interest rates. And so we would try to figure out the maturity dates and the interest rates of these products. And then from there, what we will do is use these prices that we've gathered uh, to calculate the present value or basically in simple terms, how much money we will get back if we invested in these instruments. Now, the next thing that we will do, we will try to find the zero coupon rate for these different periods of times for the instruments that we've identified. And this is exactly how we will be using the bootstrap method. So it is a way for us to help us guess or find the zero coupon rate for these different instruments that we've, that we've looked into or we are thinking about investing in. Now, this is basically what we've had for today. But before I leave you, I'd like for you to think about something, do a little research and figure out what do you think about currency exchange rate policies? How, how do you feel that countries opt for a particular currency exchange rate policy? What are the rules or maybe what are the principles that they follow? And how do they come to the decision that perhaps a free floating currency is more suitable for them? Or maybe some sort of a pegged currency is better is a better option. Do your research and we'll meet next week. Thank you.